Hello. For tonight's grisly tale, I'm going to read you a story from Fearsome Tales for Fiendish Kids. These are cautionary tales that I wrote for lovers of Squeam. Tonight's story is called Willard Willard. Once upon a time, there was a boy who couldn't tell the truth. No, I tell a lie. He could tell the truth, but sometimes he chose not to. The boy's name was Willard. Willard wore glasses and combed his hair flat across his forehead like Adolf Hitler. Willard was a boffin, a science freak who had turned his bedroom into a laboratory where he conducted ear-shattering experiments in the middle of the night, filling the still air with bubblings and clankings and fizzings and flumps. He also had a telescope. Not a yo-ho-ho -ho and a bottle of rum type of telescope like Nelson put to his good eye, but a huge, whacking great gun barrel of a thing, a vast tubular cannon that sat in the middle of the garden like a lighthouse on a tripod and pointed up into space. Willard loved his telescope. He loved to sit out in the garden on clear balmy nights and gaze at the stars till the early morning sun bleached them out of the sky. His parents encouraged this hobby and were proud of their darling boy. As far as they were concerned, he never lied, he never kept secrets, and he loved his mother and father. He was as close to perfect as it's possible for a boy to be. But this was at home, you understand. At school, he was quite different. At Willard's school, scientists were labelled as weirdos. Other kids avoided them in the corridor for fear of catching the science bug. You know the symptoms, pallid grey skin from spending all day in darkened laboratories, thin podgy limbs from never playing sport, and a complete disregard for personal appearance. Their heads too full of calculi and theorem to worry about their unzipped flies, their untucked shirts, and their different coloured socks. At Willard's school, scientists were wimpy ginks. So at school, Willard changed who he was to make sure other kids liked him. He became Wellard Willard, the toughest nut in the class, the fearless boy who had done everything, been everywhere and met Cindy Crawford on a plane. Oh yeah, yeah she offered me a peanut straight up, I'm not lying. The others were so impressed by Willard's tall stories that he was elevated to Chief Cheese in the school which basically means that he was very popular and could sit where he liked at lunch. This is the story of Wellard Willard's last lie, the one that wouldn't stop growing, the one that turned round and whacked him dead. Oh yeah, I've driven motorbikes, me. Oh yeah, I can ride them with my eyes closed. Barry Sheen offered me a million quid to turn professional, but I told him it wasn't enough. Wellard Willard was addressing a group of 30 sad saps in the playground. I can eat 15 boiled eggs in three minutes, you know. Not even Margaret Thatcher can do that. I've met her. Yeah, during the Falklands War, I commanded a tank regiment. She awarded me a medal, but I gave it away to Battersea Dogs Home. Do you know what they do there? They barbecue the stray dogs for dinner. Now, I've set hundreds of them free. Oh, yeah. I'm a great wildlife supporter. Me saved a tiger from a bushfire in the Hindu Kush once. The spellbound faces in Willard's audience lapped up his fibs like thick chocolate sauce. Have you heard? Uh, when I'm 15, I'm going into space. First boy astronaut in the world. That's me. And I can eat three shredded wheat. Really? Gawked his gullible fans. Yeah, I learned how to do it in prison. You've been to prison? exclaimed Sebastian. Armed robbery, lied Wellard Willard. But I'm, uh, I'm not proud of what I did. Uh, I was naive and impressionable in those days. A bit like you, dozy lot, he thought to himself. Have none of you ever stolen anything? The crowd of boys giggled. Well, I once took a tissue from Mummy's handbag, admitted Arnold shamefully. Child's play, 
mocked Willard Willard. I stole a kiss from Amanda, giggled Jonathan, but Willard cut him dead with a glare. When he was being hard, Willard never smiled. I've stolen a Mars bar, said Simeon. Willard snorted like they were all babies and out of his league. That's nothing, he said. I've stolen the sun. A reverential hush fell over his audience. Jaws clanged open, eyes corkscrewed onto cheeks, tongues flopped out like dead fish. Wow! gasped the all-believing crowd. That's mega! Actually, Willard had quite impressed himself. It was the biggest and best lie he'd ever told. He'd have to remember to tell it again. So, uh, so what's that big yellow shiny thing in the sky, then? said a voice unexpectedly. It belonged to a new girl called Felicity, who was listening to Willard's stories for the first time. The hard man squirmed. He'd never been rumbled before, but he couldn't admit to his friends that he was lying or they wouldn't be his friends any more. He was in a spot, and he stalled for time. You calling me a liar? he said, unimpressively. Yes. If you've stolen the sun, why is it still up there? Well, well, that's a model, fabricated Willard, that I made, um, out of string and wood and an extra strong light bulb. I've got the real one at home. Tosh, said Felicity. You're lying. Your ears have gone red. Yeah, that's because you're giving me earache, sidestepped Willard but he knew he'd just reached a turning point. If Felicity didn't ask to see the stolen son, his lie would go undetected. But if she wanted proof, he'd be in a whole jar of a pickle. All right, let's see this son then, she said. Willard wanted to punch Felicity right on the end of her nose. Um, can't, he bluffed. Mum and Dad have got leprosy, so nobody's allowed in our house for the next ten years. Well, then bring it into school, said the girl. Willard's tongue twisted into knots. Now that he'd started lying, it was impossible to stop. But every time he told another lie, he had to invent an even bigger one to cover his tracks. If she didn't shut up soon, his brain would explode. Well, I, I can't bring the son into school, he snapped crossly, because it, because it won't fit in my satchel. Not good enough, retorted the girl. You're just a big liar. You haven't stolen the sun. I have too, shouted Willard. Liar, liar, pants on fire, she chanted back. And that was the final nail in the coffin. Willard's adoring fans started to drift off. Don't go, he yelled, but they kept on walking. Alarm bells rang in his head. Dive, dive, dive! Common sense told him to tell the truth, but he had his reputation in the playground to protect. He was Wellard Willard, head honcho, main man, school supremo. All right, he blustered, halting the crowd's retreat. If you want to see my sunbeams, I'll show you. Now he'd done it. Monday morning, then, said a triumphant Felicity. Do bring the sun into school, Willard. I can hardly wait. And that was how it started. How Wellard Willard told one little lie to impress his mates and lived to regret it. Not for long, though. After school, he rushed home in a panic. His stupid lie meant that he now had two days to steal the sun. It couldn't be done. It wasn't like he could just run up a ladder and pluck it out of the sky. Oh, if he'd just kept his big gob shut, none of this mess would ever have happened. And then, while he was moping in the middle of the lawn, leaning on his telescope, he had a brilliant idea. Uh, hello, Willard, dear, said his mother, as Willard entered the kitchen. Have you got an empty jam jar? he asked. What would that be for, dear? For st Willard stopped himself from saying for stealing the sun just in time. 
His mother was a member of the neighbourhood watch and disapproved of theft on principle. There was nothing else for it. For some worm catching, he said, wincing as he did so, for this was the first time he had ever lied to his mother. I, I, I might go fishing later. Well, you run along and have fun, dear, she smiled, handing him an empty jam jar. But mind you don't catch the sun. Willard's mouth fell open. How did she know? Well, you know how easily your skin burns, she added. Oh, I see, he said. You mean careful of sunburn? Yes, dear. Why? What did you think I meant? Oh, nothing, replied Willard casually. The second lie was much easier. His brilliant idea was this. When he was Wellard Willard at school, he would often prove his manliness by exploding insects. He'd trap the ants or beetles in a test tube and magnify the sun's rays through the lenses of his glasses onto their heads, a bit like a homemade laser beam. Well, if he could magnify the sun through his telescope, maybe he could achieve high concentrations of sunbeams in his mum's jam jar. It was a rubbish theory, but surprisingly, it worked. He pointed the telescope at the sun, placed his jam jar over the small eyepiece end, and seconds later, a hundred sunbeams poured out through the bottom of the telescope and filled up the jar with fine golden dust, like sift breadcrumbs. When the jar was full, Willard slammed on the lid and ran upstairs to study it under the microscope. Each minute speck of dust sparkled like a miniature star and had around its edge a thin circle of yellow light which pulsated like a radioactive halo. Willard stood up. Blimey, he said. I think I've done it. I've burglarised a bit of the sun. He looked up at the giant sizzling orb in the sky to see if it looked any smaller. Unfortunately... It didn't, which meant that nicking the whole hot thing was going to require an awful lot of jam jars. Nonetheless, Willard stuck to his task undaunted, rising at dawn and returning to bed when the last ray of sunshine had dipped down behind the city skyline. He harvested millions of sunbeams in his jam jar and piled the stolen gold dust on a sheet of newspaper underneath his bed. When his parents asked him what he was doing, Willard lied brazenly for fear they'd put a stop to it. "'What have you got there, son?' asked his father on Sunday morning. "'A jam jar,' said Willard, slipping the hot pot up his jumper. "'Yes, but what's in it?' persisted his father, peering at Willard over the top of his teacup. "'Air,' replied Willard slyly. And what are you building in your bedroom that's upsetting your mother? The question came out of the blue and caught Willard off guard. Nothing, he said. It's very hot, dear, said his mother. It's blistering the new paintwork on the landing, and it's very bright as well, like a furnace. Oh, oh, that, fibbed Willard. That's a... Um, that's, uh, he wasn't very good at lying to his mother and father. He hadn't had much practice. That's a volcano. A volcano, said his startled father. In your bedroom? I, I mean a sun lamp, said Willard hurriedly. A sun lamp, exclaimed his mother. Oh, how very posh. That would explain why you burnt down one side of your face. Willard had noticed the red patches that morning. Sleeping on top of the sun had its drawbacks. Be a good lad and close the door for your mother, will you, said his father. The nights are drawing in, and she does feel the chill, something awful in her varicose veins. I wonder why it's getting dark so early said Willard's mother, 
after Willard had left the room. Well, it says in the paper, explained Willard's father, that the sun is shrinking, dear. Oh, is that so, dear, said Willard's mother. Scientists estimate that it will have completely disappeared by this evening. Oh, dear, dear, mumbled Willard's mother. Well, I hope they sort it out soon or my tomatoes will be ruined. That was nine o'clock on Sunday morning. Six hours later, Willard was still feverishly collecting sunbeams when the world slipped into a state of perpetual darkness. The temperature of the planet plummeted below freezing, while Willard's bedroom soared to a sweltering 2,000 degrees centigrade, hotter than Death Valley, the hottest place on Earth, where the sand flies wear insulated boots to stop their feet from burning. At five o'clock, the sun went down for the last time, as Willard trapped his final sunbeam. He had achieved the impossible by stealing the sun and could now go into school tomorrow and shame Felicity by proving that he hadn't been lying. Unfortunately, the next morning he arrived at school with the sun on his back only to find the gates locked. The building had been closed due to frozen pipes. There was nobody there for Wellard Willard to show off his stolen son too. His lie, his cover-up, his planetary plundering had all been for nothing. Not only that, but Willard was sunburned from the top of his head to the tip of his toes. His skin was as red as a fireball. Blisters had bubbled up on his face like pneumatic pillows and he was generally more uncomfortable than a barbecued Bambi in a bush blaze. His parents were sitting by the fire, their pale lips chattering in the icy gloom when Willard walked in, glowing scarlet like a neon lobster. Why are you so sunburned? asked his father, when everybody else is as grey as a corpse. Willard couldn't tell his father the truth, or he'd be blamed for the death of the planet and he didn't want that guilt hanging around his neck for the rest of his life. I I've invented a travel machine, he said, watching his parents closely to see if they'd swallow his porky pie. Oh, that's nice, dear, said his mother from behind her newspaper, and I've been using it every night for the last week to nip over to Australia to catch some rays. I, I mean, um, do a bit of sunbathing. Well, that's strange, puzzled his father. I thought Australia had lost its son too. Willard tittered nervously. Oh, sorry, did I say travel machine? I meant time travel machine. I mean, I don't go over to Australia for today's son, obviously, because it's not there. I go back in time to a time when they had loads of sunshine. That's why I'm sunburnt. Could we see this time travel machine? asked his mother. No, fidgeted Willard dodging his mother's awkward question as best he could. It only worked once, so I've thrown it away. She looked up. Only worked once? But you just said you'd been to Australia every night for a week. Willard gulped. Yes, he had said that, hadn't he? Well, yes, obviously i have been going for a week. But when I said it only worked once, I meant it had only worked once there and once back. And once I was back, I realised that if it had worked once, it would work again. And, and so I used it once more, there and back, and until, well, well, you know how these things happen. I used it once too often and it blew up. And then you threw it away. Well, is that what I said? Sweated Willard, who couldn't remember which lie he'd told last. Yes, said his father. Well, then that's what I did, said Willard gratefully. What a shame, said his father. Your mother and I have never seen a time machine before. Was it big, Willard? Huge, bluffed the boy. I suppose that's where the bright light came from, then. What bright light's that? The one I saw shining out of your bedroom window this morning. And with that, Willard's barrel of lies ran dry. His edifice of deceit collapsed about his ears like a house of cards. 
He'd forgotten that the sun didn't stop shining just because it was tucked away under his bed. Why hadn't he drawn the curtains? Oh, I say, shouted his mother suddenly, waving the newspaper in the air. Listen to this, dear. They think they know who the thief is. Thief? said Willard's father. The person who stole the sun. Willard's heart skipped a beat. Do they, dear? Yes, and... Oh, dear! Willard's mother stopped as she read the name of the culprit. Then she looked up with sad, disbelieving eyes. They think it's you, Willard, she gasped. The police think it's that bright light in your bedroom window. Now Willard knew he should have drawn the curtains. Willard, exclaimed his father, tell me what you know about the theft of the sun. N nothing, denied Willard Willard, who at that precise moment was softer than a box of strawberry creams. Then he squeaked like a frightened mouse and ran upstairs to undo what he should never have done in the first place. He had to put the sun back. If he could slip it back into the sky without anyone noticing, he could pretend he'd never had it, and then they wouldn't send him to prison. To hell with Felicity. She could call him a liar as often as she liked if he could just get rid of this sun. He'd throw it out of his window and trust to luck that sunbeams could travel both ways in space, up as well as down. He slipped on a pair of his mother's oven gloves, rolled back his mattress, and plunged his hands into the dazzling heap of gold dust. Wisps of white smoke trailed off his wrists as he ran to the open window and hurled the first sunbeams into the darkness. They swirled across the garden like a cloud of fireflies, but instead of soaring upwards into the sky, they stopped in mid-air, twenty feet off the ground, and spiralled on the spot like a spinning hubcap. Willard! came the voice of Willard's father. His parents were climbing the stairs. Your mother and I would like a word. Oh, now he'd have to hurry. It won't be a minute, he yelled, scooping half of the dust heap into his duvet and staggering to the window. Is something burning, dear? asked his mother. No, lied Willard as his duvet smouldered in his hands. He flapped it out of the window and released a second shower of sunbeams into the night. The sun regained half its normal size, but still refused to rise into the sky. At its centre, it was a deathly grey, and it dangled coldly over Willard's lawn, like the heart of a hanged man. There was a loud knock at the door. Coming! shouted Willard. He had to get the remaining gold dust out of the window before his parents came in. He tore the carpet from its gripper rods and dragged it across his bedroom floor. Then, with one almighty heave, he wrestled the carpet over the windowsill and scattered the last of the sunbeams into the sky. They shimmered across the garden and were sucked into the eye of the sparkling vortex like a shoal of electric eels slithering down a blue whale's throat. Done it! gasped Willard, turning to the door. You can come in now! But even as he spoke, there was a megaton explosion outside, and the sun came back to life, flooding its flashbulb light across the rooftops, shooting sharp shadows over the frozen earth. With a mighty roar, the face of the sun burst into flames, scorching the window where Willard was standing. Before he could move, his blood had reached boiling point. Before he could scream, his body fluids had evaporated. As the sun streaked back into the heavens, Willard drifted slowly after it as tiny droplets of moisture. He disappeared into the Earth's atmosphere, leaving only his dry, sunburnt skin as a wrinkled memento for his parents to find when they burst into the room seconds later. From the outset, Willard had been lying to save his skin. But what use is a skin when there's nothing left to go inside it? 
Three months later, Wellard Willard fell to earth as a warm shower over Madagascar and ended his life as a thirst-quenching drink for a warthog. Ha 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 